Good morning again, everybody. Siguro naman after he's very energetic. Ra ra ra, you are all awake. Kasi ako nagising ako. Um. Just for a few minutes that they have given me, parang what I wanted to do was to basically talk about what the research says about successful teachers. Um, but before that, hello, hello. All right, um, talk about um, some hindrances to education reform. Yesterday, I went around. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to the English and AP groups no, yesterday. Hindi po ako mabot sa 5.30. Um, what I wanted to do was to uh, walk through some issues that as part of my job, we will have to address. For example, if we are to succeed in um, in the K-12 reform agenda as well as with the basic educa uh, education sector reform agenda, um, we're going to have to increase the buy-in variable. We're going to have to address the lack of stakeholder involvement, participation, commitment. We need to be very good in articulating our quality standards and measures. We should ensure a policy continuum and we should make sure that delivery systems are in place. Um, so, one by one, ano po ba yung buy-in variable? I think nag, nagsasucceed na yung buy-in variable for, or buy-in for K-12, no? More people understand why K-12 is necessary, no? More people are beginning to see why in the in the ASEAN region to be able to participate in ASEAN 2015, we need to be able to we need to be able to um, measure up to the education standards articulated in the ASEAN community documents. No? Um, may buy-in din dun sa um, ma, ma, buhay na buhay yung discussion tungkol sa curriculum theory, content approaches. Um, I think more there is more space now to approach curriculum in a varied number of ways. No? Um, na hindi na siya one size fits all. And as teacher educators and teacher trainers, you need to remember that ang curriculum ay hindi biblia, di ba? Ang curriculum dapat inaangkop sa bata, inaangkop pero meron kang target na pupuntahan. No? Um, so yung localization na tinatawag or contextualization na tinatawag, sa tingin ko malakas na yung buy-in para doon. Um, we're still building a change theory. I think the Department of Education must create its change theory. How does change happen in an, an enormous department such as ours? Diba? Um, and we need to be able to observe these changes. Mahina po po yung buy-in doon. Yung, yung buy-in or understanding kung paano nagbabago ang isang napakalaking organisasyon. Parang kulang pa yung buy-in doon. And then, the curriculum development buy-in, the mere fact that there's so much feedback on, on the sessions here as well as in Cebu, and so much feedback on or comments on, on the content, I think there, that is indicative of a buy-in. Diba? Kasi ang ibig sabihin nun, tumataas yung stakeholder involvement, tumadami yung idea no? na siyempre kung minsan it's difficult to navigate, no? ganun talaga. But actually, the more discussion there is, the richer the curriculum will be. As I told you yesterday, I came from Akadim, so for me, importante yung discussion. Importante na dahil through discussion, nagkakaintindihan. No? Um, one of the things that people can assume from teachers is a lot of dedication and commitment. And I think that we must never forget to say thank you. So when you do your mass training in your turn, don't forget, please, on behalf of the secretary and the rest of the DepEd, please thank them for spending those seven days with us. Um, kasi 
hindi yun madaling gawin. Hindi yun madaling gawin na, na magsama-sama ng seven days at umalis ng bahay. Um, I think that part of taking care of our stakeholders is respecting them. They are our colleagues in the same way that we are colleagues here, they are our colleagues. Okay. The, the sooner we behave like colleagues, the better. So, though I understand, I, I am music at the moment and everybody wants to take care of my bag, it's not necessary, okay? It's really not necessary. I'm cool. I can carry my bag. What we need to do is work together on the curriculum and on the, on the approaches. Yeah. Um, we need to work on excellence, ownership, and efficiency. Alam niyo po, mahirap yung ownership na yan. Ang daling sabihin. Madaling sabihin, mahirap gawin. Kasi when people own the curriculum, magbabago ang curriculum. Kasama yan sa curriculum theory. No? Kasama talaga yan. At um, minsan, when supervisors you know, have an idea and then teachers have another idea, that change is difficult to navigate. So, as supervisors or as teacher trainers, more is expected. Diba? More is expected of you to be able to navigate the change and negotiate mo yung change na yun. Um, pero we need to also work on efficiency. Hindi naman pwedeng maging dahilan yung localization na hindi mo aabutin yung panuntunan. Kailangan naabutin natin yung standard. Um, then we need to work on quality, quality standards, the articulation. Kasi pag inarticulate mo yung, yung standard, you open yourself up to scrutiny. Di ba? Eh, talo pikon, guys. Talo pikon. If you open yourself up to, you open up the standard, you make, you will surely get feedback. Sure ball yun, di ba? Uh -oh. So, and that's part of a transparency process, di ba? And so, actually, one of the things I was looking for is the curriculum guide. The entire latag of the curriculum. And um, we're gonna have to send that to you. We also need to match curriculum objectives and measures. Kasi po, iba yung classroom measure, iba yung pag pinagsama-sama mo lahat ng measures at ma-measure mo yung impact or yung outcome mismo. No? And that's ano, a little difficult. But you see, what we have to remember is the whole is always greater than the sum of the parts. But we need to be able to see that there are processes going on that are not written on paper. For example, in curriculum, iba yung curriculum as written, or what they call intended, di ba? Iba rin naman yung curriculum na implemented. Iba pa yung curriculum na natutunan, na natutunan. Tapos, kung i-assess mo yung curriculum, iba pa yun kung magpapakita sila sa'yo o hindi. Di ba? And it's important for us to encourage them to show up when curriculum is assessed. And then we need to have, to ensure, actually okay naman, we have policy consistency within the department from the time of Brother Andrew to the present. There is policy consistency. Sometimes lang, we get distracted by the small things, you know, the small issues. But actually we have to be able to, to ensure that we have policy cover. As of last week, I was told that the K-12 bill has already been transmitted from the Senate to Malacanang. Okay, and therefore, once the president signs that, we have a law for the K-12. So, we are waiting for that policy cover. Um, and then, of course, we need to be smart in our recon re uh, reco reconsideration of policy. Okay, and then we need to look at the delivery of education, what the specific roles are and limits and boundaries of various offices. And of course, that brings us down to teachers. So, ito po yung continuum ng teacher development. Um, I'm sure you have experience with all these various levels. No, we have pre-service, whether you went to education or whether you went to a degree and then added a few units on education. Iba-iba naman yung pinanggalingan nating lahat. How many of you are education majors? How many, oh, thank you, how many of you are not 
education majors when you were in your undergrad? Oh, oh, marami din yan. And then you went into the field of education. But to be able to take the licensure, you take um, a certain number of units. And both tracks are valid tracks to go to education. Both are very valid tracks. Now what we're doing is actually in the blue line, we're doing the prof dev already. We're not, we're not supposed to do the induction. Okay? Um, what we're doing is the blue line and we're pushing people forward. Okay? And when we push them forward, we don't spoon feed them. Right? We push them forward by showing them what the curriculum is, helping them understand how they can localize that and fit that to their students. Because if, if they don't fit it to their students, then we're forcing them to learn content they're not ready for. So it is your responsibility as trainers to help them fit that curriculum to their students and then bring them forward. Malinaw ba yun? Please lang pakigawa ka. So what do successful teachers do? Successful teachers take a lot of risks. They risk. They make risky instructional decisions. They love life risk, okay? Ano? <laughs> instructional decision risks. You make a lot of risks and you decide whether your risks are paying off. Yung host natin is an example of this. It's very energetic. <laughs> um, and then people, good teachers, successful teachers teach with a lot of flexibility and understanding to meet individual students' needs. Sometimes individual students' needs is difficult when your class is very big, diba? So they're going to have to make that into a reasonable expectation. Um, the reason I'm putting it in the, the sources in there is that, well, basahin nyo, oo, pwede rin, pero pinapahalagahan ko po na evidence-based. No? May tendency kasi ang guro maging sentimental na ginagawa ko ito dahil mabuti, di ba? Um, may dedikasyon ako and so on. Pero sa totoo lang, successful teachers actually have that also. They are passionate about their subject matter. If you don't like your subject matter, medyo mahirap maging successful as a teacher. And then, they care, actually care for student lives. Not just whether they're learning the math or they're learning the history, but they're actually safe, di ba? They're actually fed. And I hear a lot of inspiring stories about teachers who actually bring pandesal to school kasi alam niyo may hindi na kumakain dun sa school niya. Kailangan natin yung bigyan ng ano, attention. Kasi unwritten job description yan pero ginagawa ng marami. Successful teachers develop highly effective instructional repertoire. Ibig sabihin niya, nangyayon siya ng strategia. At alam niya na pag hindi umuubra yung isang strategia, alam niya na magpalit. So kailangan may kakayanan ng guro na magpalit. May kakayanan at may kalayaan magpalit. At yung kalayaan yun yata ang mas mahirap gawin. Kasi yung kalayaan ang gagaling yung sa sarili at saka sa iba. Shared, shared value yung kalayaan. So I think it's important for us to be able to ensure that. You know? Um, then they scaffold frequently. Siguro naman lahat ng tao sa kwarto nito, kilala si Vygotsky. At yung salitang yan na nanggaling sa kanyang teorya. No? Um, they scaffold frequently. In other words, when children don't understand, they make it easier. They scaffold. Until you can withdraw the scaffolds. Ang sabi nga nila, di ba? Good teachers can simplify and then can make it complex later on. So you are able to go from simple to complex and back. And that can only be done if you support them when they are learning new concepts. The one thing I truly hate as a teacher practice is to give the new lesson as a homework for tomorrow. Caring, yes, di ba? Asar na asar po talaga ako dyan na 
For tomorrow, our lesson will be, for example, um, similes and metaphors. Look up in the dictionary or read pages X to Y, and tomorrow answer my questions on what is a simile and what is a metaphor. I mean, you do that with exceptionally smart kids, right? But you don't do that with everybody. When children are learning new concepts, I think it's important that we support them. Na tumaya muna yung guro, ituro mo muna. Ituro mo muna bago ka magtasa. Oo, ituro mo muna. Kasi pag hindi ka nagturo, dito wala ka nang ginawa. Hindi ka na teacher, tester ka na lang. Oo. Psychometrician ka na lang. Diba? Ang kailangan mo muna magturo bago magtasa. Okay? And then, maintain the high expectations. Napanood niyo si Sabrina. Um, diba? Yun yung isa sa mga mensahe niya sa kanyang TEDx video. Um, is that she expected high from everyone. She expected a lot from everyone. Ang hindi niya sinabi, she is expect, expecting the same from herself. Uh, yun ang hindi niya sinabi sa kanyang um, TED Talk. Okay? And successful teachers make it clear what they want. Di ba? Malinaw. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to, to identify the main character or the protagonist. You will be able to do that. So if they know what the target is, I think that children are able to latch on to the target. And then using your scaffolds, learn what you want them to learn. Again, ituro mo. I-state mo yung objective. Huwag mo basahin yung objective sa lesson plan. Parang awa nyo na, okay? State the learning objective. Oo. Hindi po binabasa yung lesson plan sa bata. Ang lesson plan para sa atin. Okay? And we understand child and adolescent development. Successful teachers also believe that everyone can achieve. And again, this is consistent with having high expectations of your students. And you assess children and relate progress to previous experiences. I just want to say that as far as I'm concerned, classroom assessment has only one purpose. Classroom assessment is for the improvement of teaching. Nothing more. You have to use assessment in the classroom to inform instruction so that you can do it better, di ba? It's not to be able to submit the grades. Siyempre kasama yun, pero hindi yun ang main purpose. The only purpose really of assessment in the classroom is to improve teaching. And I think that's very important to remember. Because what we need to be able to tell children is that, look, oh, you did this really well. I can up the stakes. I can make this harder for you. It, it will be more challenging, and therefore we will we will be able to journey through biology together. Parang ano? Okay, and finally, successful teachers know how and when to combine methods that result in high. I sorry, literacy growth. No, because the research is from the IRA. They can combine these methods. So alam nila when it is time to give children workshop, alam din nila kung kailan dapat lecture, alam nila kung kailan dapat homework, writing assignment, alam nila yon, And that's what highly successful teachers do. And all of that, except for, except siguro for, ano, the passion, all of these indicators of successful teachers na ituturo, lahat siya natuturo, di ba? You can teach them how to assess, we can teach teachers to, to identify clear purposes. We teach teachers about child and adolescent development. Lahat yan natuturo. So, I think yun yung mahalagang tandaan na though it is true that some teachers, maybe like Sabrina and Kiko, are born, most of us are made. Yeah? Most of us are nurtured and most of us are developed. And I think it's important for us to believe that if we're going to be trainers of teachers. So if we don't believe that, eh, di huwag ka na mag-teacher training, di ba? We have to believe that we can actually train people to be very good teachers. And I think in this K-12 reform effort, we need to be able to 
ensure as part of our um, of our responsibility is to ensure that we know our subject. Dapat tama yung laman ng itinuturo natin. At kung hindi tama yung laman ng module o ng guide o ng may typo or whatever, te ayusin natin. No? At magagawa lang natin yun if we have the confidence that we know the subject matter. Or we have the agency to research on whether we, we can make this better and improve it. Um, we must know how to teach it, so we must know the pedagogy. And then, we must actually be able to teach it. Kasi yung dalawa, pwede yun i-exam. You know your subject matter, you know your pedagogy. Pero yung practice, the theory and the practice, the third one is the practice. The theory and the practice have to come together. Hindi pwede yung tsorya tsorya lang. No? So we need to be able to actually teach. And these are all critical for successful teaching. No? So all those indicators, they boil down to these three things. Diba? Those indicators of successful teachers. You know your subject matter. You know how to teach your subject matter. You know the methodologies. You know the inquiry. For example, there is an inquiry. How, does, how do you inquire in science? How do you inquire in social science? How do you inquire in, how do you interrogate a narrative? How do you interrogate an essay? All of these are inquiries. No, and we need to be able to fit our inquiry into our subject matter. And then finally, we need to be able to pull it off. We need to be able to do it. So, I leave you with a quote from Max Lucado. Sabi nila, bibigyan ko inspiration and message. Hindi naman po ako inspiring. Okay, saka bata pa ako. Saka na ako mag-inspire. Okay? <laughs> Mangihiram na muna ako ng mga inspiring sa mga taong totoong inspiring. So, I suppose magandang iwanan ano, na magandang isipin na kung sabi ko nga, the only, no, the only thing I know how to do well is to teach. Yan lang po ang alam kong gawin. Diba? Hindi ako marunong magtahe, hindi ako marunong magluto, hindi ako marunong kumanta. Ako lang yata yung USEC for programs na hindi marunong kumanta. Okay? At sinasabihan nila, kailangan ko daw matuto kumanta. Sabi ko, hindi na bali. Uwi na lang ako. Okay? <laughs> Parang ganun. Pero marunong ako magturo. Diba? Marunong ako magturo. At sa tingin ko, yun yung path ko to my nirvana or my heaven, whatever you want to call it. And I want you to be able to do that too. And I think that when you do most what you do best, you honor your maker. So I hope that that's what we do. You know, if it is important to you to think this way, um, if you are a good teacher trainer, please be good at it and do it often. And when we do that together, then we honor our maker. So I hope you have a fruitful next few days. And um, I am off to Cebu <laughs> for the elementary, so I can't stay with you the rest of the time. So I wish you well. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so thank you very much. A round of applause to Under Secretary Dina Ocampo. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your time. And now, to introduce our speaker for this uh, plenary session, I call on now Dr. Elsie Esmer from uh, BSE uh, Stock Development Division. Thank you. Okay, good morning. After three days of fun, learning facilitation skills, learning standards and content, and now we are moving to planning for assessment. I know most of you are familiar with Death and Order number 73, Series 2012, which is the guidance on the assessment and 
rating of learning outcomes under the K-12 basic education curriculum. The lady behind these guidelines is our resource speaker for today. She is no other than our director for the Bureau of Secondary Education, Dr. Lolita M. Andrada. Please join me for the welcome of Dr. Andrada. Thank you, Elsie. Good morning. I'm sure that the observance among you would pay particular attention to how I do this presentation and how I get to move around and see whether I model the facilitation skills. <laughs> okay, there you go. I'd like to start with this, the big picture. And I guess it would be useful for all of us to think about the desired outcomes of K-12, okay, the grand vision, and Angkor are teaching on the core principles that underpin the K-12 basic education program and ensure that our teaching practices will contribute to the attainment of the vision. So let's begin with the end in mind. Let's imagine that all learners, all Filipino learners, will be able to develop the 21st century literacy. And everyone in school, or maybe learning alternatively, outside of the school, the formal school system, will be completing the 13-year basic education program, counting kindergarten in. Right? No one should be left behind. No one should fall through the cracks. With that end in mind, the next question would be, how do we achieve that? We need to ensure that all learners of school age will participate in the process of learning. That everyone will be in school. And those who may be a bit older and might be a bit embarrassed being in school and being with younger children might prefer to be rich alternatively through our community learning centers. Okay, but everyone has to be learning. So we need to ensure that everyone is ready for school and for learning, whether that is done formally or alternatively. We need to ensure that children and all other learners are ready for school. And this is why the kindergarten law was enacted. Because kids, as early as grade one, start to leave school prematurely. And if you look at the statistics, the highest incidence of dropouts is in grade one implying that many children are not ready for a great one. And those who are not ready for a great one, what do we do? We provide some bridging interventions. That is why previously before the enactment of the kindergarten law, there was this bridging curriculum provided, the eight-week right, program provided to those kids who went to grade one without the benefit of kindergarten. Okay. But aside from encouraging everyone to be in school or to be learning alternatively, 
We also need to ensure oh, that we're not moving. Nakatingi sa akin si Alfred. Mesmerized. Oh, dahil sa takot. Alfred, isa tingin ko siya. Baka di kita matingnan na kasi nakatingin ako sa kanila. So, ikaw mong bahala siya. Okay. So, that's completion. We're done with that, Alfred. So, let's move. Let's move on. Okay. Participation. You please? Yeah, okay. That's what it means. Okay? So, every every indicator we have should we need to, to quality assure. That's the bottom line. Quality assurance must be strongly entrenched in the school system. Okay. It's, aside from ensuring that everyone is participating in the process of schooling and of learning, we need to ensure that everyone in the system is being retained in the system. Not to repeat, okay? But we're referring to the holding power of our schools. So everyone must be retained in the system. They must be continuously learning. And those who are out there, outside of the formal system, they too should be continuously learning. So we need to quality assure the retention process. We need to ensure that there's internal efficiency in the schooling system. Okay? The challenge is not just about retaining everyone in the school system and in the learning system. The challenge is even greater. We need to ensure that everyone is moving on successfully that everyone is achieving, that everyone is attaining the standards of learning. And this is where quality assurance has to be stronger. No child should be allowed to move to the next grade or level if there are serious learning deficiencies or learning gaps. Do you agree? Does that make sense? Yes. But what happens is this. Somewhere down the line, some people, some teachers, simply do not do their job well. There are kids who are continuously being moved to the next grade and then on to the next level when there are serious learning deficiencies behind them. And this is evidenced by, for example, reading the mediation programs in place across public schools. Whenever I go around and I ask public high school principals about what programs they have in their schools, the first one that they would almost always say is that we have a reading remediation program in place. And they say that with pride. And some would even say we have that in place for about 10 years now. What does that imply? What does that mean? It simply means that the problem has been there for the longest time and no one is doing anything about it. Should you be proud that there's a reading communication program in place? It simply means that the kids who come to you are simply not able to read at their level. And if it has been there for the longest time, it simply means that the problem has not been fixed for the longest time. And that's also the reason why many children as early as the first two grades of high school would drop out. Not because they're dumb, but because they have failed to learn the fundamentals 
of learning how to learn and they simply cannot cope. It's a grave injustice to the children. We had a case of a superintendent in Mindanao, I wouldn't mention which region, who administered a reading test to the incoming first year students. There was no K-12 back then. And this is what he found. The children who were coming to high school were not ready for high school because they were not reading at their level. And so what did he do? He ordered them back to grade six. <laughs> Yet they were reading at grade four level. He ordered them back to grade six. Not one of the parents complained, but it would have been a good court case. Why? Because this was the same superintendent who signed the certificate saying that all these kids were eligible for high school. <laughs> when I was doing my, my dissertation, I was observing classes because I was studying effective teaching. I wanted to find out what made, effect, what made teachers effective. And in one of the classes I encountered was this girl who was a syllabic reader, and she was in the first year. And so I instructed the teacher to please inquire who the teacher in grade six was, and how come this girl was, was allowed to move to first year when she was a syllabic reader. And this was the information that the first year teacher got. When the, when the grade six teacher was asked, how come you passed this girl? You allowed her to pass when she was not even ready at her level. And this is what the teacher said. If I didn't allow her to pass, she would still be in my class next year. <laughs> and I'm sure this is not an isolated case. <laughs> so if our schools are still having that reading limitation program, it is simply symptomatic of a lingering illness in the system. This is, not, this is something that we shouldn't brag about. It simply means that we're not doing anything to fix the problem. And that is what quality assurance is about and what it is for. If we're serious about the mission, our mission as educators, we will protect the quality of our children's learning. Because as I said, it is a great injustice to the children. If we allow them to move, you're not being kind. By doing that, if you allow them to move with their serious learning deficiencies that we need to fix first. And so the policy is that at grade one, every child should be reading. If the child is not able to read at that, at that level, please ensure that some catch-up plans will be in place to help that child so that the following year, the child can be on the same page as the rest of his or her group. Because if you allow the children to move on to high school, the high schools will be forever locked in the cycle of religion. And then in high school, if nothing is done to enable the children to catch up, and they're allowed to complete their basic education, and then we pass them on to college. As early as first year college, they will start dropping out. Not because they're poor, but because they've been poorly prepared. The additional two years to basic ed will be nothing. It will come to nothing if we're not able to do our job well and get our act together.
Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. At these stages, there will be assessments to ensure that learning is really being quality assured. At the end of stage one, which is grade three, a national assessment will be administered. Is this going to be the responsibility of the great teachers alone? Definitely not. But the collective responsibility of grade three teachers down. At the end of stage two, which is grade six, Another national assessment will be administered. Is this the responsibility of grade six teachers alone? No. It's the responsibility collectively of grade six teachers now. At the end of stage three, junior high, grade 10, another national assessment will be administered. This is not only the responsibility of the junior high school teachers, but the junior high school teachers from grade 10 down. At the end of senior high, grade 12, another national assessment, this is the exit exams that will be administered. Again, this is not the only responsi the responsibility of the, the senior high school teachers by themselves, no, it's got to be the responsibility of the entire K-12 <coughs> stretch. When we look at the NAT, let's not do a segmentation or fragmentation of the analysis of the results. We, do, we look at the NAT for elementary, we look at the NAT for high school, and then later we compare them. The NAT in elementary, they're better. The NPS is higher. The NAT in high school, it's poorer, it's lower than the NAT, the NPS obtained by the grade 6 kids. We cannot compare the performance that way because in the first place, not that I'm rationalizing or apologizing for the poor results we've been getting, but simply to explain the fact that it doesn't make sense to interpret the results that way. You've got to look at the entire stretch. Number one, the skill sets being assessed are not the same. They're not comparable. So there's no sense in comparing the NPS. Number two, we need to be mindful of the fact that the high school guys can only do so much for the kids who come to them. You can't expect them to perform miracles overnight and overturn or reverse the results. So it's got to be the collective responsibility of everyone in the K-12 program. What happens in high school is that the teachers are simply locked in the cycle of education. The, the lessons that teachers fail to, to cover in the elementary, that's where the high school teachers would, would take off and they end up teaching and a teaching because the prerequisites have not been developed. So everyone has to has to do his or her bit well, effectively. We get we really got to to get our act together. And so if if there is strong quality assurance system in place, no one will be allowed to move on and up and then out of the system unless we can say with confidence and certainty that everyone has learned. And by learning, we mean that everyone is prepared for life. And by being prepared for life, we mean that our graduates are ready for the workplace and they're ready for further education. If we cannot say that, with our heads held high, we have no business planning our schools. Do you agree? That should be the basic message that you need to convey very strongly to our teachers. This 
experience was taken out of the NAP results administ uh, NAP administered the previous year by N NETRC in high school. And this is what it says, that those children who were frequently assessed be better on the NAP than those who were less frequently assessed. But there's a caveat that I'd like to offer that it isn't just about doing frequent assessments. It's about doing those assessments appropriately. So the bottom line, how do we then prepare our teachers for the new assessment and rating system? I'd like us to follow this roadmap. I'll begin with what teachers ought to know regarding the new assessment and rating system. I will be drawing on the principles of the, of, of, of the new assessment and rating system as articulated in Depth and Order 73. So I'll cover the philosophy, the features of the new assessment and rating system. And then from there, what we want teachers to do, like, hold your horses, my friend. Go back, please. We still have an hour left. Thank you. What we want teachers to do would be to analyze their own class assessment practices because I'd like you to challenge what many teachers have been doing. Challenge in the sense that many of the things that teachers have been doing with regard to assessment don't make sense anymore. Maybe at some time in the past, they made a lot of sense, but not anymore. So we want them to analyze what they should stop doing because it's not working in the interest of our children. What they should continue doing because it holds a lot of promise and when done well, it can, it can improve children's learning effect, uh, considerably. And from what they've learned about the new assessment and rating system, the principles, the philosophy, that Andrew thinks it, what is it that they should now start doing? And then from there, I want our teachers to understand the new assessment paradigm and transfer this, meaning to adapt this, to embrace this, to use this in their own teaching. Does the roadmap make sense? Okay. Now, Alfred, click no. So let's begin with the policy guidance and assessment. It's a policy guidance, meaning the intention is to serve as a guide, not to structure uh, what teachers should be doing, but to guide them. And this is where the, the reform in regard to the assessment and rating system is about. It's a change of philosophy. We need to challenge the philosophy that most teachers have regarding assessment. Many teachers assess mainly for the purpose of grading, right? No assessment, no basis for grading. That's, not, that's how they think and that's what they think. They're wrong. They're wrong. The basic philosophy behind doing assessment is to really have something that will that, that one can use to quality assure children's learning. Not to have a basis for grading. Get having a basis for grading will come next, but the main purpose, the overriding purpose of doing assessment should really be to quality assure children's learning. I want every teacher to memorize that. <laughs> so the, the, the emphasis has shifted to using assessment for quality assuring learning 
to 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 using that to using assessment for for grading. So the emphasis on assessment for and assessment as learning because children themselves have to draw lessons and insights from the assessment results and use this information to improve strategically their own learning. So we're we're recognizing the the, the role that children should play in the assessment process itself. That they shouldn't be simply placed at the end of the assessment process, but they should take an active part in the assessment itself. So it's assessment as learning. So it's more than assessment of learning. Assessment of learning comes at the end. Assessment for assessment as learning, that would be the bulk of all the assessment activities that we do inside the classroom. Okay, that would be the emphasis of every assessment process that we undertake in the classroom for the children. Next, please. The next guiding principle is that assessment should be holistic. And by holistic, we mean that even before instruction begins, there should already be a pre-assessment. But many teachers don't do that. They jump right into the lesson thinking that by teaching right away, they will be covering more. They're dead wrong. Alfred, stop there. <laughs> Let me explain why teachers need to pre-assess. At the pre-service level, one basic principle that we took away was Begin where your children are. And it makes a lot of sense. But many teachers simply pay lip service to that basic principle in teaching. How can you begin where kids are without doing a pre-assessment? How can you find out what background knowledge and skills children have and are bringing with them to the learning situation without pre-assessing what background knowledge and skills these are. How can you begin where kids are without the pre-assessment? In mathematics, if the standard is that you want your children to be able to apply or use factoring in life situations, how can, how can you Attain, how can your, your kids attain the standard without you finding out whether they can do the vision and the other fundamental operations? If in music you want your children at the end of two months to be able to play a musical instrument, how can they do that without you finding out whether they can read notes? If in English or Filipino you want your, your students to be able to write a coherent paragraph, how can you do that without finding out whether they can get the, get details, whether they can they can gather information, whether they can organize this information, whether they have mastered the subject verb agreement, whether they have mastered the tenses, right? Should the pre-assessment always be about written tests? Not necessarily. Let me give you a concrete example. Here's a language teacher who wanted to find out before she asked the kids to, to write an essay whether they have mastered the tenses. And so this is what she said. Kids, listen up. I want you to analyze this sentence and tell me what's wrong with it. Yesterday, I saw one caught a butterfly. Is that sentence correct? Children? <laughs> Is that sentence correct? It's not, right? Okay, let me repeat. Sabi nila. Come again. Yesterday, I saw one caught a butterfly. One smart boy at the back of the class stood up and said, Teacher, I know what's wrong with the sentence. Yesterday is past. 
And so everything should be in the past. And this is how the sentence should read. Yesterday, I saw one caught a butterfly. <laughs> What information is the teacher getting? That not all action words okay, are words. Right? So the teacher said to herself, hmm, I need to clarify that. But the teacher wanted to be certain. And so she said this time, kids, I want you to give your own sentences. What am I conveying? The teacher has to validate. The teacher has to use multiple measures, which is the next principle we will talk about. Okay? So the teacher said, I want you to give your own sentences. And one girl raised her hand, volunteering, and said, teacher, I have a sentence, I have a sentence. Okay, come on, speak up. And this is what the girl said. Teacher, yesterday, Maria go went to town. <laughs> oh, the teacher said, hmm, iha, iha. Her name is Go. Maria which is which? Go or when? Go or when? Asalam, asalam. Teacher, listen very carefully. Yung go, ma'am. Apolito, ma'am, yun yung nalang. So, yeah. you, you are wrong in pronouncing the uh, go in Sufi. Oh. So, that confirms what the state, what the, what the, what the, the information that the teacher got earlier, that she really has to clarify. That not all action words are, are birds. That it could be a family name. <laughs> okay, now, what's the purpose of doing a pre-assessment aside from what I earlier explained? The intention is to diagnose, right? Because some kids might be bringing with them some misconceptions or misunderstandings that could get in the way of new teaching. So that, that is why it makes a lot of sense to do a pre-assessment. Please convey that very strongly to your teachers because not many teachers do pre-assessments. Pre -assess they just jump right into the lesson and they waste their time and their children's time if they do that without pre-assessment, okay? Now, what questions, Alfred? Please click prior learning. Please click prior learning. Okay, so we'll just go back to that. So, let's draw an analogy between teaching and assessment and medical practice. When you go to a doctor because something is wrong with you, you don't expect that doctor to prescribe medication right away. You want your doctor, right? to diagnose what's ailing you. And that's pre-assessment. Okay? Diagnostic. You don't want your doctor to, to be quick at prescribing medication. Okay. Now, these are the questions that every teacher should be asking when assessing for prior learning. Number one, what prerequisite knowledge, skills, and, under, uh, and or understandings do I need information on which, as a teacher, I can build on to teach new knowledge and develop new skills and understandings that will enable my children to produce expected products or performances. What tools will be appropriate to collect such information? And, most importantly, how will I use the results of the pre-assessment? The results of the pre-assessment should inform teaching. And this is what you should caution our public school teachers especially. Many teachers 
have been slaves to the budget of work. They stick to the budget of work. And they, they, they treat it like a Bible. It's so sacred to them. They don't even get to modify or make adjustments to their lessons based on the results of the pre-assessment. If I could have my way, I would disallow the use of the budget of work. If teachers would use it slavishly and follow everything to the letter. The budget of work is there to guide them. And so it should be adjusted accordingly based on the results of the pre-assessment. Please instruct the teachers how to use the budget of work effectively. How to manage that budget of work, okay? And not to be enslaved by the budget of work. So should the pre-assessment tools be always about test? Not necessarily. A simple question and answer. When I ask you, for example, does this make sense? Am I assessing? Yes. If I ask you, kuha nyo? Is that an assessment question? Yes. But a teacher should never, never ask the question, do you understand? And as facilitators of the learning process, you shouldn't also ask that question of our teachers because that's insulting. But better say, does this make sense? Okay, next please. Okay, just to quickly show you a sample pre-assessment starting off with product or performance. And this is health. The content standard demonstrate understanding of nutrition for a healthy life. I chose this example because I think everyone can easily connect to this. So, what happens is that the teacher has to unpack the content standard. And when the teacher unpacks the content standard, she would have, he, she would have, what information on what students ought to do. Okay, the facts, the information. So these are the things that are the results of the unpacking. Next, please. Okay? Next. What we want our children to do with those information? We want them to explain the need to select blah, 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 analyze one's current nutritional status, compute one's caloric need, evaluate one's diet in terms of sugar, sodium, fat, fiber, etc. So you read the, the, the product insert and look at the nutrition information there and what they want them to be able to do to go on. Alfred, explain the characteristics, apply decision-making skills, etc. Okay. And then hold them. Go back to the cafe. What do we want them to understand? We want them to make sense of the nutritional requirements that they're different, that they have, that they're different from those other age groups. And they need to be able to choose carefully what one should eat based on, the, on one's nutritional requirements. And they need to understand that this is essential to a healthy life. So, the performance standard, after understanding that, the students should be able to make informed food choices. That is what they will need in life. Please note the relationship between the content and the performance standards. The content standard simply defines what children should know, be able to do with what they know, and be able to understand. But beyond that, what is critical is that, so what? What will they do with what they have heard? They should be able to make use of this in life. And the use that we want them of what they have learned is that they should be able to make informed, decisions, the choice of food to eat. Now, I'd like to start with that as my pre-assessment. Okay, uh, Fred, please click making informed choices.
Next. Oh. Okay. So that's the expected product or performance, making intelligent food choices. So the product or performance is not about being able to do a click, do a, a an album of the different food groups. Diba yung mga gano'n, carbohydrates, lahat ng mga clippings, mga, mga, mga photographs. It's not that. Please explain that to the teachers. The product of performance is how children will make use of their learning in life. That is their takeaway. And no one, no one will take that away from them once they have learned that. Sige, Alfred. Ito. Directions. It's dinner time. Imagine yourself being invited to a huge room full of foods from all over the place. There's a corner for all sorts of soup, another corner for meat dishes, a different corner for all vegetable dishes, a separate corner for all seafoods, a corner for fruits, a corner for sweets and pastries, a corner for salads, a corner for rice cooked in different ways. Because some, some people might prefer um, a different way other than having it steam for rice and a corner for different types of bread and potato prepared in different ways. Some people don't eat rice, they, prefer, they might prefer bread. You are given a dinner plate to put anything you want to eat from the variety of choices you have. You are also given a bowl for your soup, another bowl for salad, and a small dish for dessert. So it's about making choices. Now, divide your plate into portions. The size of each will be your guide in putting any food of your choice. In the appropriate portion, write the food you want to eat. If you choose to have soup, write the soup you want to put in your bowl. Do the same with your salad bowl and dessert plate. Remember what you eat should be your choice. You are given 10 minutes to make your choices. So there's a time. Uh, there's timing. So you, you need to have a time frame. You don't have the luxury of time to make all, to, to, to spend all the time you you want for choosing the food. Okay, you're just given 10 minutes. But, and this is the task, explain the reason for each of your food choices. By doing that, will I be able to draw out what children know, what they can do with what they know, can they analyze, etc. What they have understood, yes, I'll be able to hit all those just by giving this specific situation. Another point that I want you to communicate to your teachers, do authentic assessments. Children need to deal with life situations. Because that will make their learning inside the classroom meaningful. Okay? Authentic assessments. Life situations. Because transfer is about using one's learning in life. And so the situations that we need to provide should be about life. Does that make sense? Okay, I've read. Okay, next. Now, during teaching and learning, a lot of assessments will have to be done to get as much information that the teacher needs to inform and improve his or her own teaching. This is now assessment as it, of, it is now assessment for learning. The, the intention is to assess learning as it occurs, as it takes place. Okay? And this is formative. It's developmental. Okay. When you go to a doctor, and the doctor tells you, oh, you have tinnitus. There's a ringing in my left ear. And only lately did I learn, as I, as I read the literature, that it could be brought on by 
too much chewing gum, especially if the chewing gum uses aspartame, NutraSweet, the, 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 the synthetic sweeteners, yes, it can cause tinnitus. But the doctor, you know, never told me that. I only learned that from reading. Okay, so, the doc you go to the doctor and the doc doctor prescribes medication and the doctor will tell you, go back, I come back to me after a week, okay? So after a week you come back and the doctor examines you and the doctor says, hmm, you're making progress, please continue with the medication. Come back after two weeks, and you do as he as, he, as, he, as you're told. You come back to the doctor, and the doctor examines you again, and then say, "You're doing well." To speed up the process, please take this. Follow the instructions there in the prescription, and come back to me after a month. After the regimen, okay, of taking the, the medication and following everything as the doctor tells you, you come back to him after a month, and this is when the doctor will do his final check. But during the time that you 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 go back to the doctor and he and he did all those examinations. Was he going to give you a clean bill of health at that time? Not yet. Not yet. It will come at the end. Let's draw the analogy. When we teach and we assess, should we grade all those places that on a daily basis we would give? No. Quizzes by nature are short. They're short so that they're quick to check, to correct. So it doesn't make sense when a teacher who is quiz happy and cannot rest easy at night, okay, without the, the comfort of knowing that that day he, she has given a quiz. Given six classes to deal with on a daily basis, with 50 kids on average in each class, and these were this this is this is the class size in most public schools, you would have 300 quizzes to check daily, right? And if you watch enough kapatid anak without fail. <laughs> And you only find time at the end of the month to check all those quizzes. Let us assume that you have 20 days in a month. Some would have 22 days. 20 days in a month. So 300 times 20 days. 6,000. 6,000 papers at the end of the month to go through that tall pile, huh? It's really a mountain of places then. And then you find you find that you, you you do all those quizzes in two days. You get to finish them in two days. At the end of the second day, you just flat out. Your blood pressure shoots up. You're taken to the hospital, and unfortunately, you're DOA. And then in the death certificate, the doctor writes, cause of death, assessment fatigue. <laughs> and then, and to top it all, that principal tells you, you're never, never to pay quizzes. You just record them. So you analyze the results. Of what use will these quizzes be if you will be able to return them a month later? No more, no more. So my advice is that if you cannot correct those quizzes, 
better not give them. There are other ways of finding out whether children are learning, whether they're making progress or not. When they stare at you with blank eyes, that means they're clueless. If you ask a question and no, and not one hand is up, that means there's a problem. And you, just, you should be sensitive to that. You shouldn't be angry and say, okay, get one whole sheet of paper, especially when you see the principal coming to observe your class. It's whole sheet of paper. And children over time have wised up on us. Having been nurtured in the culture of assessment, they know what one whole sheet of paper would mean. They know by the size of paper you ask them to bring out how long the test would be and the nature that assessment would take. It's going to be long because there's also the risk that there might be an essay question there. If the teacher says one half sheet of paper length wise, Definitely, it's going to be long, especially if it's back to back. But will there be an essay there? And so you can give a sigh of relief. Okay? If the teacher says one half sheet crosswise, it's going to be long because it's back to back. It's like tantamount to doing a half page of a whole sheet page, whole sheet uh, paper. And there's also a reason, you cannot give a sigh of relief yet as a student because there might be an essay question thrown in. Why? Because it's crosswise. But if the teacher says, get one fourth sheet of paper, then it's definitely going to be a short one and it's going, it's going to require only short answers. So, that's how you survive assessments. It doesn't make sense to be grading quizzes and you need to please correct that practice that many teachers have. Many teachers believe that every assessment they give should be graded. It should be recorded and the score should be analyzed, but the assessment should never be graded. You also need to make a distinction between testing and assessment. Assessment is just about collecting information. It's not really about testing. Test can be a tool for collecting information and there are many ways, many tools that you can use to collect information. Okay, so that's developmental, Alfred. Now please click learning as courses. Okay, these are the great questions that we need to give to the teachers. How will I and my students track their learning, learn their progress in relation to what they need to know, what they should be able to do, and what they need to understand, so that on their own they will be able to produce expected products or performances? What teacher and student tools would be appropriate to collect such information? Alfred, please click teacher tools. Teacher. Okay, next. Yes. Some some prototype instruments, impromptu discussions between the teacher and the student. So the teacher, for example, might want to give in math some seat work, some problems to solve, and the teacher would go around. As the teacher looks at the at the the process that children undertake as they as they get to the answers, to the problems, the teacher might be asking questions. And just the process of asking questions is already an assessment. If the teacher looks around and finds out whether all kids are on task, that's assessment. And goes to the boy or girl 
who's not on task, and the teacher asks questions, probing questions, why aren't you, aren't you on task? Is, it, is there anything that you didn't understand? Do I need to give you some explanations? Is there anything I, I should be clarifying? That's assessment. Okay? And the teacher should not play that. But the teacher should record the information because the teacher should do follow-ups. Okay, now let's go to the student tools. What will this convey? That there are tools that students themselves may, may, may use to track their own progress, to find out where they are, like progress charts or progress maps, self-reflections, diaries or labs, planning charts, work plans or planners, uh, happy sad faces or red green light cards. I'm sure teachers can be very creative and I suggest in your own training at the regional level, please engage the teachers in the process of constructing these student tools. So the teacher has to teach smart, work smart by enabling children to participate in the assessment process. So that it's not always the teacher who should be doing the assessment. Students themselves should be actively engaged in the assessment process itself. So that they own the results of the assessment and they become responsible for their own progress and for their own outcomes. No teacher, no matter how good he or she may be, even though that teacher may be a Metro Bank winner, or someone like Sabrina Kiko can learn for his or her students because learning is a personal matter. Okay, next please. So, most importantly, how will the teacher use the results? And how will the students use the results of the information to improve teaching and learning? Okay, next please. At the end, of the lesson and the lesson may take several days what you need to convey very strongly to teachers is that understanding cannot be developed in one day if the teacher teaches for facts or information that can be finished in one or two days but never when he she teaches for understanding because it takes time for meanings to be constructed and for understanding to be developed. When that is done and the teacher is happy with the results, let's just visualize the scenario. Day one, the teacher gives an assessment at the end, and the teacher finds out that 35 out of 40 kids in her class are not getting it. The teacher records the information, and the teacher says to herself, I have a problem here. And the teacher has to analyze what kind of problem is this. Is this a problem with learning or a problem with teaching? Is this a problem with learning when 35 out of 40 are not getting it? Or is it a problem with teaching? That's how the teacher should analyze the results. It's a problem with teaching. The teacher should be happy. It's just about teaching. It's not about her. Right? Right? Okay. Some teachers take the results too personally. Okay, they shouldn't. Do, they shouldn't feel that way. Objectively, this is just about my teaching. A strategy is simply didn't work. That is why it makes a lot of sense not to be grading quizzes. I think it's totally unfair for a teacher to give quizzes simply because the uh, to grade quizzes simply because the strategy didn't work. If the strategy didn't work, don't punish kids. Now, if the strategy worked, should you grade the quiz? Still, no. Don't. Don't. You shouldn't. Now, day two, so what do you do? 35 out of 40? This is a problem with teaching, so I changed my strategy in the hope that this time it will work. And because your quiz happy, you give a quiz. This time, it's 30 out of 40. Should you jump, should you jump with joy? Not yet. The result is slightly better, but 
that's still bad. Now you analyze, you record, and then you analyze. What is this? Problem with teaching or problem with learning? Still with teaching. And then you say, ay, salamat, it's still not about me. <laughs> so you make adjustments. You stretch your lesson. Meaning that the lesson intended just for day one has to be stretched. So you, make, you need to make adjustments to your budget of work. And that is why you need to explain to the teachers, don't be slaves to your budgets of work. No, you can't, you can't use this slavishly. So adjust, adjust. Third day, you repeat the lesson, but this time you change the, the strategy again. And that night, as you thought of a better strategy to use, you pray, you prayed hard that this time the strategy would work. So, you give the quiz, the results, 5 out of 40. Should you jump with joy? Yes. Yes! But, what do you do with the 5 kids? Abahala na kayo dyan? No! Ask those five kids to stay behind, do some more work, teach them more clearly, give more examples, okay? So that the following day, they will be on the same page with the rest of the class. So don't please allow those five kids to fall behind. Okay? Every kid should be on track because if you allow any child to be with the rest of the class, with those, with those gaps, those, that child will not be able to learn the succeeding lessons. So make sure that every child will be on track. Okay. If three or four times in a row, of giving assessments and the results are still poor, the serious question that the teacher should be asking himself or herself is, is this still a problem with teaching? Because if the results are consistently poor, then there is seriously wrong with you, the teacher. So it's not anymore about your teaching, it's about you. So you change your profession. <laughs> Chef Brett, because you're doing more damage done, good. Okay? So you leave the profession and you become a principal. <laughs> division or the region and apply for the position of supervisor. <laughs> Sorry, Ade. Biro lang yun, ha? Biro lang. Pero kung totoo, okay lang. Sige. <laughs> oh, next. At the end, okay, at the end. When you're happy that everyone is, on, is learning, everyone is making progress, the standard is being attained, then, at the end, that's when you do your Summative assessment. Now you assess learning as outcome. As outcome. So you do an evaluation, meaning you put a value now to the information you're getting. Okay. Alfred, please click learning as outcome. And let's see what questions should guide the teacher. Evaluate what has been learned, okay? As outcome na to. In terms of knowledge, what students know, what they can do, what they understand, and what products and performances they're able to produce. What criteria will I use? What tools will be appropriate to evaluate the different levels of learning outcomes? How will I utilize the results of the evaluation? Okay, next.